Now, I have divided the uh, nine uh, fruit that are mentioned in the uh, in the book of Galatians 5, 22 and 23, into three different categories. And these very happily fall into a natural order as they appear in the writings of Paul. And they, and they uh, tell you themselves what nature of fruit they are of. That, that is just up for us to comprehend what the scripture itself has told us. Now, the first of the fruit that occurs in our lives is an emotional fruit. He gives us something that absorbs us and indwells us and becomes a part of us and is expressed in love and joy and peace. These are inner qualities, inner virtues uh, that the Lord causes to abound and to teem in us. Now, one of, the, one of the things that we need to understand is what is intended by the word emotions. And this is another error sometimes that we encounter in the Church of God, we encounter in the Pentecostal movement, is a gross misunderstanding of the word emotions or emotionalism. And we talk about people being very emotional and people not being emotional. And I happen to be among those that has always been classified as being unemotional. People try to pull a practical jokes on me and they always fall flat. No one can ever have fun pulling a practical joke on me because I just don't get excited about it. I go on, might blink a time or two and that's the end of it. But uh, it, it, there's no fun to pull a practical joke on someone who doesn't react with some kind of startled uh, uh, appearance or, or words or uh, behavior. And I just don't operate that way. I was born of good old Teutonic stock. My mother, good German mother, Brimer is her name. And uh, she is still alive and with us. And I came by to see her on the way out to here. My mother always said, when I would hurt, don't cry. And if I got uh, tickled, don't laugh too much. In other words, no matter what you do, the Spartan approach and uh, the stiff upper lip and, and you suppress all of those things that other people might uh, give vent to. Now then that has not stood me in good stead, I must admit, in the Pentecostal movement. I, this German blood gets in the way. I wish sometimes I had some nice Hawaiian blood in me. And, uh, and so I could go hulooing along and, uh, and uh, fit into the pattern with it a little more. But even that beggars the point. And it does not in any way speak of what emotions really are. Emotions are not generally what we call emotions. Now listen to this very carefully. I want you to understand me very, very well. Some of you uh, are going to need it for your own explanations of your, of your behavior in days to come. The emotion is the feeling that you have. The way you express that feeling is not the emotion. No living human being is unemotional. We are all emotional. Love is an emotion. Now some express love one way and some another. Joy is an emotion. Some express joy in one way and some another. Peace is an emotion. Some express peace in one way and some another. Hate is an emotion. Some express hate in one way and some another. Fear is an emotion. Courage is an emotion. All of these things are the emotions. The emotion is the feeling that you have within you. Now then what we generally have in mind when we speak so blithely of emotionalism is not the emotion at all, but it is the way you respond to the emotion that you have. Let me give you an example. And I have told this in the book. If uh, you have the book, be sure to read it. When I was an 11-year-old boy living in Atlanta, Georgia, 
I was standing in the back window of uh, our home overlooking a cornfield where we live, and there was a railroad uh, track, two tracks, uh, nearing uh, Atlanta. And it was during the Depression, as I have already told you, this was 1931, and I saw five hobos, uh, young men, very young men, coming along the tracks out of Atlanta. They would uh, get a ride uh, by jumping aboard a freight as it, uh, freight train as it came by them. They met a train carrying a heavy load, rumbling and thundering through the cut, as it was called, and vibrating the whole earth around it and snorting like an enraged animal as this thunderous train plowed on through the cut toward Atlanta. Now, the boys were meeting this train. Now, another train at that very time leaving Atlanta came through the cut meeting this very train that they had just met. It came upon them from behind. The boys felt the vibration, but they mistook it for the train that they had just met or were in the process of meeting. And they uh, heard the whistle as the engineer frantically blew it, but they again thought it was the train that they were meeting. So the train uh, plowed into the boys. Luckily, very luckily, uh, two of them managed to leap to safety, but the other three were killed instantly. And by the time I could get across the field uh, to where it had happened, uh, these boys were dead. But two of them escaped with their lives. Now this is the thing that I want to mention. Both boys had narrowly escaped death. Both boys had narrowly escaped horrible injury and pain and the cessation of life. And they both felt the same awe, the same glory, the same wonder that they had escaped. And one of them went whooping and leaping and jumping down across the cornfield. He was really turned on. He really was cut loose, and he gave physical, physical demonstration of the awe and the wonder and the pleasure that he had that he had escaped death. The other boy fell down between the furrows of the cornfield and sobbed away, trembling and sobbing. Now, which one was emotional and which one was not? They were both emotional. They were equally emotional. But one of them, one of them expressed it by leaping and jumping and running. The other demonstrated it by being almost uh, petrified with his, with his wonder and, and with his fear and awe of the thing that had happened. How dare we then come along and say, well, boy, he sure did take his escape very lightly. He didn't take it lightly. He was as overwhelmed by it as the boy who did the running. Now, the same thing happens in our worship of the Lord. We all have the very same emotions. But some of us express it in one way and others of us express it in other ways. And these things are generally determined not by the emotion, but by our individual background and upbringing. The training and the teaching and the temperament that we may have. Now this must be perfectly understood because it does a terrible injustice to some of our people to call them unemotional because they are able to sit quietly in a worship service and not show the same kinds of uh, joy or the same kinds of fear or the same kinds of whatever that emotion might be. The emotion is in them locked up there and each one expresses it in his own way. Now, I uh, 
brought, I was brought up in a day, grew up in a day, that we had old time funereal wakes. I don't know if you have those now or not. I surely don't. And uh, that is when someone died, you sat up with the dead, day and night, till the time they were buried. And I always enjoyed going up, going wherever the dead was and sitting up with him or her because we got treats in the middle of the night and you heard a lot of stories in the course of it. It, 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 it was a real fun time to sit up with the dead in these long weeks because, well, you got several things. The grown-up people bragged on you about how wonderful you were to be there. You liked that. And then they always served you refreshments all along during the night, and you enjoyed that. And the stories you heard, man, you never heard such stories as they would give all night long for the two or three nights uh, that they were sitting up with the dead. Now, in the uh, course of it, there were two ladies that I know whose husbands died, and they were left widows. Now, one of them was utterly, utterly unhinged. She lay down across the coffin and called her husband, come back, come back. She beat on it, the casket. She wailed, and she went on. And the people always ask, how did they take it? How did they take it? And we went to funerals in those days just to see how did they take it, you know? If I'm out of your league, I'm sorry. I'm telling you about where I come from. And so the woman that beat on the casket, wailed and moaned and cried, was married in six months. <laughs> and I have an idea she is looking around at the funeral. <laughs> Now then, another woman was dry-eyed all the time, utterly and totally bereft, astonished by the grief and the sorrow that was in her. You understand? How did she take it? Oh, man, she must not have loved him. She didn't cry a tear. She didn't do a thing. Yes, she did love him because she dedicated the rest of her life to carrying on the work that he was doing. She said, I will live the life that he would have lived. I will now live for both of us. Now then, who are you or who am I to say that one was emotional and the other was not emotional? They were both emotional. They were both overwhelmed with their grief. One expressed it one way and the other expressed it another. I want you to remember that from here on out because back in my day of being young those things weren't understood I guess and man if you couldn't run fast jump high and shout loud you didn't have it and I never did have it <laughs> I've had people to try to pull things over on me and say it's just no fun to be around you brother Con you never do react and I go home still, and my wife says, did you enjoy the sermon? I said, oh, yes, wasn't that wonderful? She said, well, you didn't look like you were enjoying it. Now, she has some Indian blood in her. You know, ooh, 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 and so on. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but I do, when I enjoy it, I listen. Man, I get down there in there with the man and listen to what he's saying. You understand? And so, uh, even today, people go to church. They look at these uh, people, President Black, and everybody loves Brother Black. And they look at all these nice, smiling, pleasant people. And it's nice. That's wonderful. And I love it too. But man, they watch me for three days to see whether I'm alive or not. <laughs> and then when they find out that I am alive, they still try to figure out whether I have religion or not. <laughs> but I do. I <laughs> really honestly do have religion. I just don't respond to the emotional stimuli in the same way that others do. And not all of you do either. So don't belittle 
the emotional virtues that God has given you by trying to do what is not right for you to do. Amen. What is right for you to do is what you are. You be what you are, but you see that whatever you are is totally given to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, he takes over in, in his life in us the totality of our emotional apparatus. He controls our fear. He controls our uh, courage, our hopes. He controls our peace. Certainly he controls our joy and our love. And when you try to be what you really are not, you make unnecessary mockery of what God would do with you. As I'll tell you later, in uh, 1970, we lost in our family my eldest daughter, whose husband had been a professor here at West Coast Christian College. And when Sarah died, the first thing I did, I was general overseer at the time, was to call the family together in the chapel at the hospital and say and tell them that one thing was necessary and that we give evidence of the Christian faith and of the Christian certainty that God expects of his servants. That is all. In the face of total tragedy, let us be sure that we comport ourselves as Christians should. Now, when the Lord does this for us, and He indwells us, and He touches all the cords of our emotions, He brings our fears into control. He undergirds and puts a foundation beneath our faith. He enhances or sublimates our love. He does all of these things so that our lives become filled with love and joy and peace. Love. Love is the first one. So let us look at it. When I get to be an old man, if I ever do, I used to look forward to being old, but I've decided I just am not the kind that gets old. There's some that just don't do that. Some are born that's time to be young and good looking all their lives. Not our fault, we just turned out that way. You know, that, that, no, 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 nothing I can do about it, it's just the way it is. But if I ever did get to be an old man, and if I ever did write the work that I would want to be the definitive work of my life, it would be on this subject, love. Because it is the most misunderstood subject in the world today. Now, when I spoke here at a commencement exercise several years ago, I did speak on that, and my subject was the awful burden of love. And so if I repeat some of the things today that I said then, then I, I cannot help that because I do not have total recollection of everything I said, though I uh, could speak for an entire week or two weeks and never uh, say the same thing just on this one subject of love. The Lord calls upon me, number one, first of all, primary, foremost, to be a man of love. And any person who is not a person of love has missed the whole mark of Christianity. Of all the things the Christian religion does, it is to give love. When aging Tiberius lay dying on the Isle of Capri, one of the most evil, debauched, diseased, vile men that ever lived, every now and then I have to go back to the annals of Tacitus just to 
review and to see that a man could have been as vile as he was. But he mentioned on his in his last days that he had never met a people like the Christians who preached the strangest gospel of peace and love. Things that were not really known or understood. And it was by those two, those three you could say, that they were able, the Christians, to bring down the Roman Empire in time. It is by our showing these fruit in us that gives us mastery over all of the affairs of life. Now then, if love is as important as I am saying, then certainly there are some things in the scripture that we need to give consideration. To begin with, there are three classes of people that you are commanded by scripture to love. Number one is the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. Number two is the neighborhood. Love thy neighbor. Number three is your enemy. Now that is the whole range of your acquaintances and associates and you, you, you are commanded to love every one of them. Love the brotherhood. Now I don't find that very difficult. I find it very easy, in fact, to love the brotherhood. I love my brothers and sisters in the Lord. They think like I think, usually. And I can certainly make allowances for little slight deviations that we may have. We, we appreciate the same things. We are loyal to the same things. I love people who are like me. Because in them I see a replication of what I think they see in me. Therefore, it's easy for me to love the brotherhood. Amen. Some time ago, when I was in Switzerland, a man by the name of Walter J. Hollenbeger, who is the world's foremost authority, or he was at that time, he possibly has been replaced now by John Thomas Nichol. But uh, at that time, Hollenbeger was the world's foremost authority on the Pentecostal movement. We set up two different uh, appointments, neither of which we were able to keep in Switzerland. So he came to the United States for us to meet and confer for a week. And we did so at Lee College. In the course of our week of conferences together, I asked him if he in his travels to the islands of the South Pacific, the Caribbean, all continents, if he had discovered one thing that distinguished every group from all the other groups. And he said, yes, that was true. And he was pleased that I had wondered if that would not be the case. Otherwise, you would flow together and lose your identity. But each one had something that identified it. And I asked uh, Dr. Holenbeger one day when we were having lunch in Cleveland if he would uh, mind sharing with me what was the one distinguishing feature he had seen in the Church of God. And I told him that if he would share it with me, I would never betray him by telling it to anyone else. He said, I'm very pleased uh, to share it with you, but I won't hold you to that promise. I don't care where you tell it. And so I'm telling you now. He said, the one thing that I have seen in the Church of God, whether in Europe or Africa or Asia or the United States, the one thing that sets you apart from all others that I know is your clearly manifest love for one another. 
Now, he didn't say for the world. He didn't say for our enemies. He said for one another. In other words, according to Holenbeger, we in the church of God have come to a refinement that is close to perfection in the way we love one another. And that's good. That's the one first of all we're supposed to love is to love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, that ye have love one to another. Now then the devil would like to tear that up. And he invents all kinds of artifices to see that it's done. Here I am on the college campus. And I don't know, but I just dare say there are two or three terms that float around on this campus. Let me try a few. Do you have some that you designate as being liberal? And others that you designate as being conservatives? If you don't, then you're one of the few college, college campuses, if not the very only one, that I've never heard that happen. We label one another and tuck each other away into neat little categories of what we think about them. I've been in the Church of God since the 1930s and I have never met a liberal in the Church of God. What we talk about being liberal is whether we like red ties or blue ties. Short hair or long hair. Loud music or quiet music. Whether we run a lot or sit still. We're talking about some of the strangest set of things I've ever heard of to try to determine whether someone is a liberal. A liberal does not believe in the virgin birth of Jesus Christ. He does not believe in the divine inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. He does not believe in the resurrection from the dead. He does not believe in eternal life for the righteous. He does not believe in eternal damnation for the wicked. A true liberal is something that I have never met. Now, I have met some people that might think that it's all right to do certain things and and it makes the people that uh, don't think that way a little angry. If people ask me, Brother Con, what are you? Well, I'm an anti labellia That's simple. I just don't believe in labeling people. Anti-labels for everybody. I'm just a child of God. I'm not liberal or I'm not conservative or anything else. I'm just a child of God. I refuse to swallow something as true just because my best friend believes it. And I equally refuse to reject something as being true just because my detractor believes it. Let me find the truth and let me stand there. The devil would like to build walls between us. And if I love you enough, I can allow for things that you may do that I do. I like classical music. Great day. That, 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 that was terrible. Huh. Here is a boy born in, 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 a, in a hokey country music loving family. And if they ever did hear anything as highfalutin as a Strauss waltz, that was beyond them. And here is a boy in their household under their roof loving Handel and Haydn, and Mozart, and Beethoven, and the whole gamut. And my classical music library runs into several thousand uh, stereo albums, and so on. Now, who am I to crook 
a finger at someone who likes Barbara Mandrell. Or Kenny Rogers. Now there's some I'm going to blank at when you get to them, but I'm not going to criticize you if that happens to be your musical taste. Now the same thing is true in literature and the same thing is true in many other aspects of life. I have no right to try to enforce and impress upon you my particular likes and dislikes unless the scripture is clear in its prohibition of them or its espousal of them. All of the other things are cultural. And somewhere along the line, we have to become mature enough, back to your answer, the question last night, to acknowledge that there are cultural faux pas that are not scriptural, spiritual sins. There are certain things that are unthinkable for me to do culturally. I was preaching in the in India. And in the Orient, all parts of the Orient, where I spent much time, most of the Oriental countries, I was preaching away about um, love. And I mentioned how I had met this beautiful, black-eyed, raven-tressed, olive-skinned young woman. And how my heart did a flip-flop. And how I wrote her letters while I was uh, away in the ministry and we were planning to get married. And man, I caused a flap. My interpreter had to save my hide. He didn't interpret what I was saying. He let us be already married before I wrote her a lie. Because if I had written to that woman before she was officially my wife, then I would have been guilty of the gravest social sin. Do you understand? Well, I have to make allowances for those who have those mores and love them. They are a part of the brotherhood. Love the brotherhood. When I and Anglo go down into South America, I have to be aware of and live with the fact that they have a totally different set of social mores. All right, all right. No quarrel with it. Neither do I want you quarreling with me because that happens not to be mine. Do you understand what I'm saying? Love the brotherhood. Next, love thy neighbor. That one used to worry me a lot. I used to think it said love your neighbor instead of yourself. <laughs> Man, I sure don't do that. And I know I don't do that. I love myself. But it doesn't say that. It says love your neighbor as you love yourself. As you love yourself. Excuse me just a minute. I didn't want to, but I, I must. I think I'd be uh, unfair if I didn't back up before I get into this and go over one more. And that's the matter of styles of recreation. Nothing in the world pleases me more than to put on a good record, put my headphones on so it won't disturb my wife, and listen to good music. If music comes into me, it really does something physical to me. It builds me up and, and it renews my strength. It renews my inspiration. It, it, it rests and relaxes me. All I'm doing is getting recreation. 
There are others who like to sit out in a boat with a fishing pole and hell of those slimy fish and strictly worms and I can't stand it. The only way I want to handle a fish is on a fork. Amen. Then there's some others who like to get a golf club and go out on the uh, fairways and they like to hit the golf ball. I've tried it. Sometimes it has taken as many as five swings even to hit the ball. I guess I would have liked it if I could ever get the ball on the green. But I play any over. I go from this side to the other one and then back and forth. And I never can get on the green. I'd like to get on it sometime to see if I could get it in the hole. But who am I to say that it's all right for me to lie on the floor listening to music for my recreation, but that it's not all right for you to get out there with a fishing pole and fish? Or as a friend of mine gets on his motorcycle and goes along the backcountry roads. We're all doing the same thing. We are recreating ourselves. We're renewing and refreshing our depleted mental and spiritual and physical resources. I have no right to condemn others for doing Another thing I do, I like to work crossword puzzles. Scrabble is my favorite game. The only one I'm any good at. And, and, and the first page I turn to in any newspaper, up to and including this very morning before coming here, was to turn to the crossword puzzle and work it. Well then, if that is my recreation, who am I, if I love you, to condemn you for your recreation unless it violates the mandates of God and it is not fair when people get up and work out on the congregations their particular dislikes and personal preferences hmm. does anyone have any question right now on this I know I'm dealing with some things that we need to be big enough to consider. Yes. Excuse me, Doctor. Uh, you're talking about recreation. Uh, you're saying that uh, we have to condemn people for the type of recreation that they choose to have, right? Unless it is in violation of the Word of God. That is right. Uh, do, you, do you think that uh, watching a movie, like going to a movie, the Church of God, kind of you know, put that down for any student to go to a movie? We. He has asked if that would extend also to the watching of a movie. The uh, corporate body, the body as a whole, has come to certain decisions. And these decisions are clearly laid out for us. And we, by choosing to be a part of that body, agree to the limitations that are there. Therefore, if I am going to be a part of the body, and that is the decision of the body, then I will respect that, and I will live according to it. Now, the church is very careful in specifying the kinds of, uh, of, of things that are taboo, and therefore, I will respect those, and I do respect those. The same thing occurs in uh, other forms of input, such as the literature that uh, we read. For instance, when I first was saved and joined the Church of God, I can remember the utter consternation caused in the local church because one of the men had read Gone with the Wind. 
you read the Bible and the Church of God Evangel, and that was it. <laughs> so there have always been some that are out there on the edge of the knife that are appealing to and for judgment. Justice. Not, not, not uh, justice, but good judgment. Good judgment. Now what makes a moving picture wrong? Is it the fact that it moves? Is there sin in motion? Is it a fact that it is a picture? Are pictures sinful? No, those are ridiculous, aren't they? Then the, the wrong is in what its content is and what that content does to your spiritual life. It goes beyond that many times, Paul says, and its goodness or badness is determined not just to what it does to you, but what it does to your brother. There are certain people who are genuinely offended by what they regard to be unscriptural behavior. Paul said this, and in his day it concerned the eating of meat. Eating of meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And he said, if I find that my eating of meat, which I know that there is nothing wrong with it, offends my brother, then I will not eat meat. I will be protective of him. I admire and applaud that attitude, and I hold that same attitude myself. Now the wrong here is, don't always be bamboozled by people saying, you offend me. When the Bible talks about offense, he means something that you do that is grievous enough, it actually pushes someone back from serving the Lord. That is what an offense is. An offense is, usually our people use the word offend, you offend me, just mean I don't like what you're doing. That's usually exactly what they mean when they say it offends me. I have never, ever, ever, never have I been offended by anybody. I dislike a whole bushel basket of things. But I've never been offended because to be offended means that I am so adversely affected by it that I am pushed back from serving the Lord. That's why the Lord said that it's better for a millstone to be hung around your neck than for you to offend one of these little ones to cause them to stumble in their spiritual life. Thank you for that question. Now then, love the neighborhood. Did I say we were going to get through with this in this session? The Bible tells me who my neighbor is, and my neighbor is anyone that comes within the range of my knowledge and interest. And there is one thing I cannot for the life of me understand. Here's a good Decent, or not so decent, man dying in, the, uh, in his house. On one side of him, there's a good old Holy Ghost filled, tongue speaking, loud shouting, holiness man. And on the other side, there's a cigar sucking, <laughs> beer drinking, unbeliever and the holiness neighbor will sit there and let that man die without so much as caring and let that unregenerate unbeliever be the one who comes in and expresses concern and what can I do for him where do we get it that we're so high and mighty that we can draw our skirts around us and quit being a part of the neighborhood or the society where we live? Amen. 
There's something wrong and awry with our holiness when our holiness makes us want to draw ourselves in a little crack somewhere instead of being the leaven that is disseminated in the loaf or the light that goes into the darkness or the salt that brings savor to the entire plate. God has called us to love our neighbors. Now we don't, we don't have any difficulty with loving our brother. Love the brotherhood. Glory. Hallelujah. I love the brotherhood. But it's a lot tougher to love the neighborhood. And this whole attitude, and Jesus very strongly emphasized it when he told the story of the Good Samaritan. Because he in this story deliberately and very possibly in reality, I mean thinking of a real case, drew the picture of a Levite and a priest who went by and failed in the test of neighborly love. Isn't it interesting to you that Jesus took two religious figures to show that they were the ones so caught up and enwrapped with their own affairs that they had no time to help a man in distress. I don't get it. I don't get it at all. God has put me in this world to be a blessing to every person I meet if I can possibly be a blessing to him. Some time ago I was driving through Hattiesburg, Mississippi. It was about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning, very dark. The gasoline station was not busy. One young attendant, and when he came out of the car, he began to check under my hood. And he began to talk, and he said, Sir, he said, please listen to me as I talk said, I have just received a call that there's someone in one of these buildings here with a high-powered rifle aimed at me right now. And I am to put all of the money in a garbage can in the back. And his associate will drive by and pick it up while he holds this high-powered rifle on me. said, is there any way you can help me? Well, I had no choice. I was suddenly thrust into the middle of a situation that if I was a Christian, I would have to do something about it. I said, you keep working with my car. And I spoke to my wife and our children, and I said, we will not move until this is taken care of. I walked into the station while the young man continued to work around my family on the car. And I went to the telephone and went through the uh, pretense of looking up a number. But what I was really doing, of course, was calling the police. I called the police and explained the situation to them. And when I did that, I then came out and stood beside the young man, leaned over and looked at the car, and we uh, continued to work at little things under the hood until the police arrived. And when the police arrived, and they took over, then and then only did I drive on the way with my family. Now to me, as a Christian, there is nothing less that I could have done. Do you understand? I don't buy this whole baggage about not getting involved. I am involved. And Jesus sent every one of us out to be involved. 
to make this a better world to live in. I'm not telling you that to, uh, for the wrong purposes. I'm just telling you that if you expect to show the Spirit the spiritual fruit of love, you've got to love your neighbor. And your neighbor may be someone you have never met. It's anyone who comes into the scope of your awareness or the opportunity for you to help. <laughs> love the brotherhood, but you also love the neighborhood. Now then, the Lord comes to the next one. And he didn't trust Peter to say it. He didn't trust Paul to say it. I say that. Of course, I'm not being, uh, I'm being a little whimsical about it. But it's still the truth that he is the one who said it and not one of them. What is the hardest scripture in the whole Bible for you to live up to? Be honest. What, what is the very hardest one of you? Thou shalt not get rude stuff? That little bother me. But this one really gives me a fit. And I'm one of the sweetest, most loving, and lovable old men you'll ever meet. Take my word for it. Don't ask anybody else to believe it. But this one gives me a real, honest to goodness fit. Jesus, in his great sermon on the mount, seeks times, six times, six times met head on what the Jews had been taught and were taught. And six times he said, ye have heard that it hath been said, but I say unto you. Six times he said ye have heard it said of them of old time but I say unto you now these highly religious people who had lived since the days of the Babylonian captivity had become so embroidered and enmeshed with their religious ideas that they had missed the point of being a child of God. They had one great concern and that was to be a child of Abraham. And Jesus said, think not among yourselves that you're a child of Abraham. God is able of these stones to raise up children of Abraham. I'm not concerned about your being a good son of Abraham. He would be saying to us, I'm not so interested in your being a good church member. I want you to be a child of your father which is in heaven. And if that rattles your thoughts, so be it. It is still the truth. If the Lord was right here today, He would say, I'm not so interested. In the things you're interested in, I want you to be a child of your Father, which is in heaven. And there's only one way to do it. Ye have heard that it hath been said over and over until finally he gets here in Matthew 5 and 38. The fifth time he will say it. Ye have heard that it hath been said an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that ye resist not evil 
shall smite thee on thy right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the Lord, take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him two miles. Go with him twenty. Give to him that asketh thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Ye have heard that it hath been said. This is the final time. The sixth time. Ye have heard that it hath been said. Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you. This is bold. He's right now in the nest of all of this. And six times he points out clear things that they have been taught and held to be sacrosanct. And he says you are wrong in your beliefs about it. Four times he says you don't go far enough. And twice he said you go too far. You got to be right. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Do good to them that hate you. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. That ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Glory, hallelujah, forevermore. I'm not interested in your Abrahamishness. I'm interested in your godliness. Now we fix our labels and we've got them and we call ourselves that. We like to call ourselves certain names. Holiness people. Pentecostal people. He's not so interested in the labels we have affixed to ourselves. He is interested that I be a child of my Father which is in heaven. And the only way I can do it is to love the brotherhood, love the neighborhood, and love my enemies. Love my enemies? Love my enemy? How under high heaven can I love my enemy? Maybe you know what an enemy is? An enemy is somebody that will tear you apart. An enemy is someone that hates you, curses you, Despitefully using you. Have you ever felt used by somebody? And the sickest feeling in the world. To feel like you have been used by somebody. I've been used. And it's not a good feeling. Someone look in the book and find I have a diagram here showing these four um, virtues that we're to have. I believe it's on page 56. Yes, it is. On page 56. I show here how the Lord calls upon me to meet four violent, vicious evils toward me with beneficent, benefiting good toward the one that sends the evil toward me. Now, brother, I cannot do that in and of myself. When everything in you is screaming out, for vengeance, you've got to love him. You've got to bless him. He says do some positive things for the one who is doing absolute things against you. Now, oh, brother, this is tricky. What would you do if you know there's a guy that would snap the rug out from under you if he could get a hold of your rug. And all the time he would do it, you've got to hold his rug. 
Then what would you do? What would you do if you know there's a guy over there that would like to dismantle you and he'd do it without the bat of an eye? If he could find the monkey wrench, he'd take the bolts out of you when you fell in a scrap heap on the floor. And you get a chance to bless him. Now it doesn't matter whether you bless him or don't bless him, he's not going to thank you because he'll never know it. Come on. What then would you do? You can scuttle him, skewer him, fix him good. And he won't blame you because he can't feel any worse than he already does. Besides that, he never will know. Or you can benefit him. Which one will you do? That's tricky. I had a I had an opportunity like that some time ago. Man alive, there's a fella circling me and snatching at my rug, trying to pull it right out from under me. <laughs> and all the time he's grabbing at my rug, I had to hold his. And I and I passed that test in flying colors. Praise God, I really did. I really came through with flying colors. I was so proud of myself, the devil almost got me with pride. <laughs> you see, it's tricky <laughs> when you get into one like that because you, you back into one out of another. <laughs> Love your enemy. Okay. Now we come down to it. What does he mean for us to do? Love has a very definite meaning in Scripture, and we must discover what that is. A girl came into me when I was president of Lee College. Now, you don't have anything like this at West Coast, I'm sure. But we had kits and caboodles out with Lee. It's just one of those things we had. This little girl came into me and said, Brother Gone, said, uh, I need you to pray for me. I said, why? She said, well, I just don't love my roommate. <coughs> well, that's pretty serious. Not to love a roommate. And I said, well, what makes you think you don't love her? What, what is it that you don't love? She said, well, I just don't love her. She's messy. She doesn't clean up her room. I have to do most of the work. She plays her music too loud. Keeps me from studying. Now you don't have any like this here. <laughs> she stays up late with the light on so I can't go to sleep. And she's always preaching to me with a holier than thou attitude and I just don't love her. I said, well, if she was sick, would you pray for her? She said, of course. I said, if she was hungry, would you go out and get her a biscuit? Sure. If uh, she had difficulty, would you help her in her difficulty? She said, yes. I said, well, it sounds to me like you love her. You just don't like her. <laughs> and God doesn't require me to like everybody. He just requires me to love everybody. So you see, I can't like an enemy. An enemy will curse me. Now, I don't mean cuss me. I've been cussed in a lot of different languages. I can take a cussing. But an enemy would curse me if the last vote of whether I go to heaven or hell was left up to him. He'd send me to hell. And all the time I'm, he'd send me to hell, I'm trying to get him to hell. Now that I am commanded to love him, 
but how on earth can I like him? You understand? We would have had to love the likes of Adolf Hitler, but there is no way you could like him. We would have to love Idi Amin, but there is no way you could like him. The disciples had to love Emperor Tiberius and Caligula and Claudius and Nero, but they sure couldn't like them. Liking is having a kindred spirit that involves a positive affection for her. That's what liking is. Now the beautiful thing of life is to love somebody and like them too. But you know what? I love me, but I sure don't always like me. Not even myself. <laughs> when I wipe that poor little old zitzy kid out, I went home and I said, Charles, why do you do things like that? And I despised myself. I didn't like myself at all. I had overreacted. I had obliterated. You understand? But I loved me all the time. Now then we get on down to it. Jesus said, love one another as I have loved you. Now what is love? Paul, in writing to the Galatians, said, By love serve one another. Every time in the Word of God that the love of God is mentioned, I'm sorry I can't always turn through these pages as quickly as I would like to, but surely someone can find it for me. I found it now. Page 53. Page 53. Every time the love of God is mentioned, when I was teaching at Lee College, I made the students search this out for themselves, and before I had had to give anyone the answer, they already had found it for themselves. But I don't have time to go through that with you. I'm going to have to tell you right off what it says. Every time the love of God is mentioned, it shows Him doing something for the one he loved. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. And when He had thus spoken, He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Unto Him that loved us and washed us from our sins in His own blood. He loved us and sent His Son. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. He that loveth me shall be loved to my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Hallelujah. Then there is one thing I can do to my enemy that he cannot say nay against. I can benefit him. I can defend him. I can help him. I can serve him. I can do that which will help him toward an awareness of Jesus Christ. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. Love the neighbor and love the brotherhood. I've taken all my time and I've got to just one. Just one. And I was going to get to all nine. Just love. Just love, love, love. People have made love into a parody a valentine word, something that a lovesick boy croons into the ear of a moonstruck girl. That's not love. 
people do the most terrible, debauching things in the name of love. Love must benefit its object. Love must build up its object. Anybody you love, you will benefit. You will not tear down. I can't, I can't go on. I could. And that's my danger right now. I have a terrible danger right now. I would like to spend the rest of this whole seminar on this one subject. I would like to lead you through the scripture and show you the eight or eleven different ways that Jesus loved people and show you how we love people differently and we respond to people differently. And I would like to show you very, very much, I would like to show you how that uh, love is given to us to be the healing balm between us and all the rest of the world. And I would like, I would like so much to show you how love encompasses responsibility, involves the human element, and brings in the divine, and issues them from one fountain. I would like to show you what love really does. Mm. What a tremendous thing is love. What a tremendous thing is love. But let me, just in closing, go to just one scripture and show you the kind of value that the Word of God places upon it. I read it last night. I read it again. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, though I am totally Pentecostal, in my appearances and worship style and have not love I am a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and <laughs> have not love. I am nothing. There's something that strikes me hard. And this when I see the great Pentecostal appearing manifestations. But I don't see a love life backing me. Anybody that will use other people for their own advancement is a far cry from what Jesus Christ is talking about when he speaks of love. Someone told me one time that my error at Lee College was that I did not get up twice a year just before they went home for the long weekend and Easter break and rain them out. Really rake them over. I said, about what? He said, anything. Just send them home mad. <laughs> and when they get home and they'll tell their parents and their pastors how mean you are then their parents will love you and have confidence in you and pastor them. <laughs> I said, if you're telling me that the only way my presidency can be successful is for me to use that student body toward my own ambitions and aims, then you're talking to the wrong person. Find you somebody else. feel about all of life. If my advancement is dependent upon how I can step on others, then I just won't advance. You understand what I'm saying? Amen. Jesus calls us first of all to love one another and the neighborhood and the whole body of enemies that we have. We have one minute 
And if I if I start in on that minute, I'll take five more. So don't don't do it to me. Does anyone have a question just before we go? Is there any question or any comment? Anything at all? If you're brave enough to answer it, ask it, I'm brave enough to answer it. Yes, go back. Uh, sometimes scripture teaches us the, uh, the our enemy, the devil, as the uh, enemy. And uh, sometimes the we Christians have a great deal of uh, confusion distinguishing between the, our true enemy and uh, our adversary as uh, devil the enemies. So, uh, do you have any formula that we can distinguish between that the enemy, what we call the our enemies, and the enemy that the God defines them? Uh, not, not really, not really. The devil is our enemy. He is our adversary. Your adversary, the devil, is ruling the lion and so on. He is, he is that, and uh, he is the author of all evil. He is the fountain of all evil. Most of the human race who become enemies, and there are many who do indeed become really, truly enemies, and the church of God has advanced through them, have suffered it that those who are definitely inspired of the devil but the devil obviously is beyond any possibility of redemption. But no person is. Therefore, any human being that I have ever met, I've never met anyone, maybe one or two, that may have uh, sinned away their chance of redemption. I'm not sure about that. Because that's another whole deep subject I'll get on another year when I come here and teach on the anatomy of evil. But, uh, I'm never called upon to love the devil. I am called upon to love the enemy. That would include Judas Iscariot. That would include everyone of that nature. And even though, even though that enemy is inspired of the great fountainhead of all evil, the devil himself. I still have to love him because there is a chance for him to be lifted above that source of evil and become a child of God. There's no real formula. No, I had not even thought of that as a, uh, as a circumstance. I'd like to give some thought to it. Thank you a lot for asking me. Amen?